Hi, romance readers. I am Liz Donatelli. Welcome to Reader Seeks Romance, the number one romance novel talk show on YouTube. New York Times and USA Today bestselling author Catherine Center joins me to discuss her contemporary romance, Hello, Stranger. And Catherine shares her reading list and writing life in Quickie's Q&A fun segment. Enjoy and be sure to like and subscribe. Welcome to Reader Seeks Romance, Catherine. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Okay. Congratulations on the release of Hello, Stranger, which received a starred review from Publishers Weekly and a ton of praise from readers and reviewers. How does that feel? It feels amazing. Um, you know, I think that you write books because you're trying to impact people. You know, you're trying to say something that matters to people. And so for me, hearing back from people that they loved it is like, it's the best thing there is. There's nothing better than that. It's great. I'm very grateful. This was my first Catherine Center book. My mom has read a number of your books and she is a big fan. Now I am a new fan after having read Hello Stranger. And I plan now on going back and, and reading your full catalog. Now you have, I believe is Hello Stranger, your 10th or 11th full length novel. Oh my gosh, I am losing count. I, I'm okay. going to go with 10, but I could be wrong. It's a lot. It's We're in the double digits now for sure. Yes, yes. I was wondering, does it become easier or harder to write romance stories as you move along in your career? For me, it's gotten easier because, you know, for me, the process of getting better as a writer has been to pay closer and closer attention to what I really love in a story and then to study how to get better at doing that for other people. And so as I've gotten clearer and clearer about how much I love romance and not only not only how much I love it, but why mm -hmm. I love it and what parts of it I love, like what specific parts of a really good love story like kind of light me up and keep me turning pages until late, late, late. As I get clearer and clearer on that stuff, I think I get better and better at doing that for other people. So, so I, yeah, it's gotten easier and easier for me over time because I know yeah. what I'm trying to do and I know why I'm trying to do it. Right. In Hello, Stranger, main character Sadie is a portrait artist who develops face blindness or prosopagnosia. How does Sadie's new reality affect not only her career, but her romance journey? What happens to Sadie kind of breaks everything open. And that's what I love about the kind of stories that I'm writing, which are sort of, they're romance, but there's also a lot of personal growth in them, right? Mm -hmm. So the main characters mm -hmm. always have some kind of personal challenge, sort of kind of personal disaster that they have to sort of face in, in the over the course of the story. And part of the reason for that is that I love stories about people who have to pick themselves up after life has knocked them down. Like that's my favorite kind of story because I'm not really very good at resilience and I'm not really very good at um, bouncing back quickly. And so I'm always trying to get better at that. And I'm always kind of trying to see how other people do it. And I'm kind of trying to study it. Hmm. And so um, I love stories about people who have to go through something hard and it forces them to sort of figure out what really matters, you know, and, and, yeah. and what they care about and what, what's important in life, truly important. Yeah. And so um, what's great about that part of the story for me is always that I think it's the things we struggle through in life that um, that bring wisdom to us, right? Like this, that's yeah. where that's where the wisdom comes from is the struggles. And so I love to have a character have to struggle and I do it in lots of different ways in lots of different books. But, but then to add into that a love story at the same time um, for me, it just amplifies everything, right? Because you are open to all kinds of things, new ways of seeing, new ways of feeling, new ways of approaching your life, different perspectives, different frameworks, when everything has kind of been shifted around and rearranged. And so um, when you're going through something hard, you can kind of see the world in a different way. And you can learn lessons that you kind of needed to learn. And especially in Hello Stranger, you know, Sadie's whole thing is that she never wants anyone to help her mm -hmm. right it's really important to her to seem like she is okay all the time and right as her life is falling apart 
this guy comes in who's like sort of pathologically helpful. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and yes. she has to, you know, figure out what to do with that. And she does actually need help in that moment. And so her ability to kind of reject it all and sort of keep all the walls up, you know, and pretend to be self-sufficient is is impacted by the fact that she literally can't do that in this moment. She is right. too big. Everything she's facing is too big for her to do it by herself. And in comes this person who wants to help. And so it kind of forces her to accept help and to accept, you know, caretaking in this whole new way that she's not used to. And I think those two things work together in the story. So that's really fun about it. So there's a scene in Hello Stranger where Sadie is using her sense of touch to explore the face of her neighbor and potential love interest, Joe, his face so that she can paint his portrait for a competition in which she has placed. I don't know if it came to your mind while writing it, but I totally thought of Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze and Ghost with touching together, making the pottery for some reason, because it's such an intimate scene that it's not where they're having sex, but there's this touch, you know, this connection, this intimacy. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, it's a really, the scene is just filled with sexual tension and it's so delicious. Is that touch technique actually used by those living with face blindness to create art? Or is that your super sexual creative invention? Um, that was my creative invention, but, oh. it, but it was inspired by lots of stuff that I read about how people do all kinds of things, you know, and, and I think it's true that, um, it, you know, the fact that she can't see the thing that she needs to see for me as a writer was an opportunity to look at other ways of seeing. And yeah, I mean, pretty early on when I figured out that this was what I was going to be writing about, I knew that there was going to be some kind of a scene where she was trying to paint this guy's portrait and she decided to try and, you know, touch his face to sort of see him that way, right through touch. And, you know, whenever I'm writing a book, I always have certain scenes that I, that are kind of like tentpole scenes that I just like kind of can't wait to get to, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I always write in chronological order because I'm easily confused and I'm not great at the time space continuum. So I don't want to get things out of order because I won't remember yeah. if I put certain things in or not. So I always, the, the actual typing of the story into the yeah. document, I always go just chapter one, chapter two, oh, all wow. the way through. But I know about things that I'm going to be doing well before that. Right. And mm -hmm. so I knew that the scene was going to be happening mm -hmm. and I, it was sort of churning in my head and, I, you know, just like sitting in traffic, I would kind of be thinking about it and like, what are some things that could happen? And, and I was looking forward to writing the scene. Like it was one of the oh, things yeah. that was pulling me through as I was writing. Cause I was like, this is going to be so much fun. Like, I just can't wait to get to this. So oh, yeah. 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 It works. <laughs> it works. It was, it was good. I was like, wow, I've been so riveted to this scene in which nothing of a truly sexual nature happens, but there's all of this intimacy, which is something I don't normally uh, read or experience in, in a novel. I was like, wow, I can't believe how compelling it was just her touching his face and describing it to us, to the reader, as he reacts to, to her. So um, yeah, I thought that was brilliantly done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I will, I will say that... Um... So I am married to a middle school teacher. Ah. Uh -huh. And so my, my love stories tend to be kind of fade to black. And mm -hmm. it's partly because I know that um, his kids are like that he teaches are very yeah. curious about what Mr. Slenner's wife. Oh. Right. And so, <laughs> you know, I am constantly at book fairs and festivals and school events. Yeah parents are buying my books to give to their 12 and 13 year olds, oh, okay. right? Mr. Center's wife's book. So I do have this kind of like set of middle schoolers sitting on my shoulder. And I mean, you could actually make mm -hmm. the argument that it's probably better for them to learn about spicy things from me <laughs> than from the internet or somewhere else. But yeah. so far I have not ventured into that because I feel this kind of awareness that mm -hmm. like my audience is yeah, not just adults, right? My audience is much broader. And actually, um, yeah. so, and actually my book started out kind of as women's fiction with strong romantic elements. Right. But I've gotten older and wiser. They've become more and more romancy, right? They've yeah. leaned, I've been moving in this trajectory where I'm focusing more and more on the love story and just yes. letting myself enjoy that. And um, so I am in this 
phase where more and more romance readers are finding me mm-hmm. and there, you know, there is, um, I was surprised last summer when my book, The Bodyguard came out, but some people were very disappointed that there was not more spice. Ah, okay. It's been a topic of conversation. Not everybody. Some people yeah. love that there's not as much spice. It's like a nice change of pace or they can give it to their grandma and not have to feel, you know, and not have to blush. But um, there are some people who are like, Catherine Center, we need more spice, you know? And so that's <laughs> been a, kind of an interesting thing to watch. But I was thinking about it in the wake of the bodyguard coming out, people mm-hmm. wishing that they had, you know, a little more time in okay. the sort of world of sensuality. And so I thought, well, what's a good, happy medium for me on this? You know, yeah. what's a way that I can make it sort of satisfying and sensual and 3D and really let us enjoy yeah. what's there. And so I made mm-hmm. a conscious decision in that scene to okay. really slow down and yeah. just, you know be in that moment with all the senses that we could possibly be in that moment with right yeah. and just really let everybody just soak it up and enjoy it and that was um mm. purposeful you know I was really trying to I knew that I was going to have a certain limitation we were not going to go all the way right but we were but I wanted what we did do in the story to be really really satisfying in 3d and like yeah. alive, alive in your mind, you know, I worked on that. <laughs> I just have to let you know that there's at least one person, aka my mom, who is very glad that in the bodyguard, it wasn't um, explicit, because yeah. my mom read it. And she said, Oh, I like Catherine Center's love stories, because they're nice. They're nice. I, you know, there's not all this, you know, uh, sex happening all over the place. Because um, <laughs> in my book club, we read a book that we didn't know had a lot of sex. And my mom read it and she was not really a fan. So she's like, yeah. oh, I like, you know, Catherine Center writes nice romances. Like those are the romances <laughs> I want to read. I was like, all right, mom. Yeah. You know, I've seen, I definitely see both. I see both yeah. out there a lot. You know, there are some people yeah. who are like, this is just a really nice change of pace. Or I yes. love that I can give it you know, to my daughter-in-law and not have mm-hmm. to feel like weird about it. And then, <laughs> yeah. you know, and then the other side of it is there are people who are like, we need more. So I've been, I've been really mm-hmm. noodling on like how to make everybody happy. We'll see. Yeah. We'll yeah. See. Well, I was happy. So <laughs> that's all that matters is that you made me happy. I mean, for me in a love story, really the, mm-hmm. the, the, the biggest, like the most essential thing for me in a love story yeah. is the longing. You know, that's yeah. the thing. I That's what I've signed up for that journey. That's what I want in that journey. I want to just long, I want to just salivate for these two people to get together. And, and for me, it's like very much situated in the heart. Like I really, really, really want to just be on the edge of my seat waiting. And I will stay up all night. Like if a writer can do that to me, I am so overjoyed and I'm so happy. And I will truly like the sun will be rising, you know, in the sky and I will still be flipping those pages. So that's for me, that's the crux of it all. And I think the other parts of it are, are great and fun and I support them. But, um, as long as I feel like I'm doing okay, as long as I I can activate that sense of longing and get us all just like waiting for that moment when they overcome all their obstacles Mm -hmm. and finally get together. Yes, yes. So as Sadie navigates face blindness, she begins noticing attractive qualities in men other than their faces. For instance, she admires her veterinarian's gait, G-A-I-T, his manner of walking. What non-facial qualities do you find attractive? Like, does it do it for you? The the gate, how they walk, the 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 strut, the stride, or is it something else? So the gate, um, the specifically talking about the gate was something that came out of the research that I did for the book, because oh. that really is, if you do have face blindness, that is a thing that you really pay attention to as a way of identifying a person, right? That's that's a thing. So that part of it came from the research, but you know, I have lots of non facial things that I like find appealing about people. And like, for some reason, I have a whole thing about men and their shoulders. Like I'm a, I'm just a big fan of like that broad sort of um, King Cobra sort of effect of like a big set of shoulders that kind of narrow down to like, I really, I weirdly notice men's shoulders. I don't know what's going on there, but um, interesting. So I'm thinking like uh, if there is a lot of hair on the shoulders, is that a no, or is that virility for you? Or is it like, you like, you know, hairless shoulders, you know, like I would say probably hairless on the okay. shoulder. Um, okay. 
But, uh, you know, I did recently see a, a Tom Selleck appreciation <laughs> post on Instagram. And um, there were a lot of pictures of him shirtless, you know, from the 80s. And mm -hmm. I grew up with a big crush on Tom Selleck. And yeah. I but I was looking at him, I was like, wow, that guy's really got a lot of hair on his chest. And I and I suddenly found myself thinking about how you don't really see that in pop culture. Yeah. And actually more like everybody's kind of waxed and it's a right. very different look. But I was like, wow, like, let's see the 80s come back. That'd be fun, you know? Yeah, get some hair back on those shoulders. Yeah, and just a little different. Yeah. But yeah, so I think there are things, there are all kinds of things. Like, I, you know, okay. the ways that, yeah, there are all kinds of things about men and yeah. specifically. Like I think about my husband, like I really love his hands. He's got these sort of hands. very strong, you know, impressive, mm -hmm. nice looking hands. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I mean, I think that when you are interested in somebody or when you're attracted to somebody, mm -hmm. you pay attention to all kinds of little tiny details yeah. that you would absolutely never notice yeah. in any other person, right? Or in any other, mm -hmm. time. because suddenly just everything about that person is fascinating. Yes. You know, so you're, you know like, so I, just, I have a new book coming out next summer, my 2024 book that I just turned in. Ooh. And the main character in that book likes this guy. And she has a thing about like the shape of his nostrils. Like she just loves oh, I can see the that. way yeah. that his nostrils sort of attach to his face. <laughs> but she, and she thinks about it a lot. And then she's constantly telling herself, like, don't talk about the nostrils. Like, do not <laughs> talk about the nostrils. Because she knows that it's going to sound crazy, but like, for whatever reason, there's just something about that shape that just kind of calls right. her. So yeah, I think we all sort of hook into certain things about people, you know, right. whether it's like, you know, the, I like an Adam's apple on a guy. Like I'm always very interested in like what's mm -hmm. going on there and yeah, you know, lips, these little creases right here, mm -hmm. the way a person's eyes crinkle. I mean, those are all yeah. face things that I'm suddenly talking about. But, um, but, yeah. but I love focusing on that because that to me is real. That, that's realistic that, you know, yeah. instead of always reading books where it's always the same physical features that are celebrated, like this is going a little bit deeper and more nuanced. A lot of the message is about reframing your perspective and reading your book has reframed my perspective of romance fiction because it's so different than what I've been reading it's like you know but there are other things that could work um <laughs> and other things that could be focused on that are still um sensual or even really make you feel the love between them more yeah so yeah. I felt as if I was living in reading Hello Stranger the act one of the nuggets of wisdom <laughs> of the book so yeah so every part of that was was exciting for me so according to your website because I did research you almost attended art school. <laughs> so was writing Sadie as a portrait artist a way for you to fulfill that unexplored life path? I definitely am very interested in artists. And I'm 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 very interested in creative lifestyles. And I get that lifestyle much more than I would. Like it would be, I think, much harder for me to write about like an investment banker, mm -hmm. you know, than it would be for me to write about an artist because I... <laughs> I don't, I don't really understand numbers. You know, I'm not a math person. Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, that would be very challenging to kind of study that and, and write about it in an authoritative way. Um, I do a ton, like, even though I didn't go to art school, I went to writing school instead. Mm -hmm. um, I still do a ton of art. Like I just compulsively cannot stop myself from making things all the time. Like I'm very crafty and, oh, nice. um, and it, I've actually found a way to tie it into my writing life because in addition to writing books, you know, writers also do things like social media. And so I have an Instagram account. And one of the things that I do on Instagram is I will take quotes from the book and I'll try to create them in ways that are visually fun. So I will like take a book and I'll take a big Sharpie and I'll write out a quote like on a book page, you know, in sort of um, time lapse to going really quickly yeah. as a way of trying to bring people inside the book. Because one thing that's tricky about a book is that like, here it is, right? It's just this object. Right. And, um, you know, you have to be invited into it somehow. Like, you're, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean anything until you open it up and go inside. Yeah. So I'm always trying to think about ways to invite people to come inside these stories and like, you know, hear what the stories are saying. And so, yeah, so I've used all of that interest in art and all of that interest in sort of visual creativity as a way to um, try to bring the quotes from the book to life and try to bring the stories to life. So I do actually use a lot of that stuff, even though I'm not a professional. 
and you know, and an artist, and I have not been, you know, to school or anything, but I, I do get to do a lot of things. Like I painted yeah. these flowers, for example. Um, well, I was going to ask, is that because <laughs> I had a feeling like that feels like that might be Catherine's work being, she said she loves to, she still is artistic and yeah. that's awesome. That's fantastic. In, 20, in 2020, my book tour got canceled, you know, because of the pandemic as yeah. a lot of authors that happened. Yeah. And so, but I just thought, uh, this is all so bleak. Like, I don't want to be doing, um, you know, zoom events with just a big mess behind me in the living room. <laughs> I'm going to make something pretty and it's going to feel festive and celebratory. And it was really just meant to be for that book tour, but I wound up loving having the flowers so much. I just kept them. Yeah. Oh, I do too. Oh, I do too. <laughs> so, awesome. um, yeah. so, so yeah. So, and, and the question about artists, like it was something that I felt interested in, mm -hmm. which is kind of the thing that is always kind of driving me with stories. Like, like if it's something I'm curious about or I'm interested in, what would it be like to be a portrait artist? I'd love to know what that yeah. life is like. So it was fun to get to write about it because I got to like spend a lot of time imagining living that life, which is something right. I like to do. I understand that while you were researching face blindness for Hello Stranger, you discovered something about yourself. Could you please share? So when Sadie, the character is... Um, figuring out that she has face blindness, one of the ways she comes to understand that is by doing some online tests, which are real. So you can go online. If you feel like maybe you're not great with faces and you're kind of wondering about it, mm -hmm. um, you can go online and to a place called faceblind.org. And they have a whole series of tests that you can do and they'll flash faces up on the screen and then you try to remember them and match them. Mm -hmm. And by the end, they will tell you kind of where you rank in, in your ability to recognize faces. Gotcha. And what I discovered, I went and took the tests because I was trying to see what Sadie's experience would be like. Yeah. And in the process of taking the test, I found out that I am actually very, very good at recognizing faces. And um, I'm what they call a super recognizer, which um, means that I could like go and work for the FBI, you know, like looking at faces. <laughs> um, that is awesome. Would you consider doing that as a side hustle? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's. I think it's really just destined to be one of those unmarketable random aptitudes that I have in my life. So like, I'm very, very yeah. good at recognizing actors in movies, you know, for example. Yes. As am I. Uh, yeah. I want to work for the, the FBI. And see. Yeah. It's, it's, it uh, but it's, you know, it's not a useful, it's, I don't know that it'll ever be a useful thing for me, but it's, it's just kind of a fun thing that I'm pretty yeah. good at, at oh, saying, that's Oh, cool. that's the guy who was in that thing from 10 years ago that we right. saw. Right. Well, remember this face, Catherine, because someday I'm going to sneak up on you in Texas <laughs> and see if and put you to the test and see if you remember me. I yeah. will definitely try to. OK. You know, if you should decide to branch out into mystery, you could have a whole mystery series about someone who's a super recognizer. Yeah, and that, that helps them solve mysteries. That's actually a great idea. I'm just if you use that idea, I just ask that you add me to the acknowledgments. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just throwing out ideas. Thank you. That's, that's, that's a lovely idea. I think that somebody <laughs> ought to do that. Um, I think someone who herself is a super recognizer would be the perfect one to write that. Yeah. Except for that. I don't really read a lot of mysteries. So um, I think that the, I think as a writer, you are definitely best off writing the kinds of stories that you mm -hmm. love to read. Yeah. Um, and there is always this, I mean, you know, we're all different, right? We're all drawn to different types of stories. Yeah. I'm definitely drawn to love stories the most of any kind of story. And always with mysteries, I have this funny sort of part of me that's like, why does it even matter? This person's already dead. Like, why, like who cares? I've never, I've never heard anyone with that perspective on mysteries. <laughs> I mean, like with a thriller, I get it, right? Because somebody's chasing you and you've got to figure it out, like on the time clock, right? But there's right. This part of me with a mystery that I'm like, what? what? I think you, I think if you love mysteries, you have a very high mm -hmm. curiosity, yes. right? You want that curiosity satisfied. Mm -hmm. And I am curious, but not, not that curious, not that curious. <laughs> so I'd like to get back to some of the nuggets of wisdom for the reader, such as how you can win even when you lose and the benefits of reframing your perspective as the writer of Hello Stranger, what wisdom did you take away from the experience? Lots of things. I mean, I think every time I write a story, um, I am empathizing so hard with the main character in the story. You know, I'm I just go inside that story and I and I really, really try to imagine what it's like for that 
person going through whatever they're going through, like not just in a theoretical way, but like in a, in a, in a three-dimensional, you know, in a three-dimensional way. This is the only way I can really describe it. It's like from the inside out. And, you know, the thing that I think is so incredibly valuable about stories is that they're kind of the best, they're kind of the next best thing to real life experience, you know? So, I mean, stories are basically kind of like a virtual reality for human life. And the thing about real experience is that it is where wisdom comes from. And so when you go into a story and you kind of merge with whoever the main character is in that story and you go through the hard thing that that character is having to go through, not just with them, but like as them, right? And you're empathizing so hard that you are not just seeing what they see and hearing what they hear, but you're also like hoping for what they hope for, right? You're feeling their emotions, right? You're you're longing for what they long for. You're When they're scared, you're scared. When they fall in love, you fall in love. Like that's an incredible act of the human imagination to be able to empathize at that level. And once you've done that, once you've gone in there like that, and gone through a story as someone else, then all of that wisdom that those characters pull out of what happened to them, you get to have it too, right? Well, it's like, yeah, it's such a great way to um, learn how to be better at being alive. You know, it, it's a way to learn how to be a better human. And so for me, writing a book is just does the exact same thing, except for that it doesn't, I don't just like read it in a couple of days, the way you do when you blow through a book that you're loving. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a year, you know, it's a year of my right. life. And so one of the reasons that in stories, I keep going back over and over again to things that I myself struggle with right. um, is because every time I write a novel about somebody struggling with those same things, I get better at that struggle and I get wiser and I have a different perspective on how to deal with those things. So like I wrote a book called Things You Save in a Fire, where mm-hmm. the main character really has to struggle with forgiveness, right? That's a big topic. She's been wronged in many ways by many people. And, you know, I'm not great at forgiveness. I mean, I've got people in my doghouse from middle school still, you know, <laughs> <but> that's <laughs> it's not an area where I'm thriving, but yeah. I would like to be better at it. You know, I would yeah. love to understand how it works and have forgiving people as like one of the things in my skill set. So I, that writing that book was a real opportunity for me. And I went and read up on it. I was like, how does this even work? Like, we all know that forgiveness is good, but like, how do you actually do it when you need to forgive someone? How do you let go of all that anger? And how do you move past the grudges that you want to hold, you know? And so I came out of writing that book wiser and better. And the same Mm. thing is true for Hello Stranger, you know, looking at how to see people differently was helpful for me, right? Looking at how to, how to redefine winning in the ways that she has to was helpful for me. You know, I, I am always trying to be more grateful in life. Um, It's really easy to fall into looking at all the things that aren't going the way you want them to. And um, I think gratitude is sort of like the key to it all. And um, sometimes I'm really good at it. And sometimes I struggle much harder to be good at it. And so, you know, I think Sadie really has to learn how to sort of count her blessings and find the upsides of all the kind of crazy stuff that's going on around her. Right. So, yeah, I mean, every time I write a book, I come out a better person on the other side. And I'm trying to do that for my own inner reader, but I'm also trying to do it for everybody else. Like anybody else who wants to come along on the ride. Hopefully we will all come out on the other side, like inspired and hopeful, right. And satisfied and kind of list out, you know, and like a little bit wiser with a different perspective on how it all works. Yeah. That's the hope. So reading your novels, we are also experiencing your personal character arc as a person, as a writer. So it's like, we're, we're, we're seeing you develop as a person, as a writer. I mean, it's actually the way you've just stated it. I feel like I want to read all those books so we could become friends <laughs> <laughs> on it's some true. level. I'll be your spiritual friend. <laughs> yes, That is absolutely true. Actually, if you read my books and love my books, we're already friends, you, you know, because we care about the same stuff and we're, yeah. we're wrestling with the same things and we appreciate the same comedy and, you know, mm-hmm. 
I think yeah. it is a deep connection that writers have with readers. If a reader right. loves my books, I love that reader by definition. Okay, I'll keep reading more of your books. <laughs> <laughs> your 2013 novel, The Lost Husband, was adapted as a romance movie in 2020, starring Leslie Bibb and Josh Dumel. Yes. And your 2015 novel, Happiness for Beginners, has been adapted as a rom-com for Netflix with Ellie Kemper and Luke Grimes. And that releases this month on July 27th. Yeah. What was your level of involvement in the movie adaptations? And have you met any of the actors? I did meet the actors. It was really fun. Um, I so I so my level of involvement was fairly low because they basically they bought the rights to these two books. It's the same screenwriter director for both movies. Her name is Vicky White, and that. she uh, bought the rights to The Lost Husband and made this fantastic movie. And it was actually slated to come out in April of 2020, which you may recall was the <laughs> month when every movie theater in America shut down. Uh huh. So we were gonna have a premiere, we were gonna do a whole thing. It was by far the most exciting, glamorous thing that had ever happened to me. And instead, uh, the pandemic happened and it was quietly released on streaming services like Hulu and Vudu. Mm -hmm. And you know, we tried to get people's attention, but. I pretty much thought that was it for that movie. I thought, well, that's that, you know, this is going to be swallowed by the pandemic. But then what actually wound up happening was, of course, everybody got trapped in their house. <laughs> and so people started watching this movie online and telling their friends about it. And, you know, I think it is a, a comforting movie about people who have to get up after life has knocked them down. And I think that was exactly the kind of movie we all sort of needed in that moment. And so it just, this movie just started selling like hotcakes. I mean, it was kind of everywhere. And um, Netflix heard about how well it was doing and they put it on their platform in August of 2020. And when it went to Netflix, the very next day it shot to number one and it was the number one movie on Netflix for four days in August of 2020. Wow. And, uh, and it wound up in their top 25 movies for the year. Um, and so because it did so well on Netflix, it was like this little sleeper hit, mm -hmm. um, this little indie movie from Texas. Uh, the director, the writer director came back to me and wanted to see if I wanted to do another movie together. So we did. So that's how, that's how happiness for beginners is coming out this month uh, as a Netflix original. Um, I will say for the lost husband, I got to go to the set um, and do a little cameo in the movie. So if you ever watch it and it's on Netflix right now, you, um, I'm there. I'm I'm pretending to be a shopper in the farmer's market and I am <laughs> purchasing goat cheese from my own main character, which is very trippy. <laughs> and uh, I also got to meet Josh Dumel that day because he was on the set and he, <laughs> it's such a funny story because he came over to say hi to me. Uh -huh. You know, he was like, I hear you wrote the book. You know, it's so nice to meet you. I'm yeah. Josh. I was like, I know who you are. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, but actually what really happened in that moment was that he was so handsome and so movie star like, right? He's like six, five. He's huge. Awesome. He's got great shoulders. Speaking of shoulders. Um, and he uh, was wearing this like Western pearl snap shirt. I mean, that shirt itself should have gotten an Oscar just for being awesome. Um, and he came up to talk to me and he was so beautiful and movie star like that I forgot how to talk <laughs> like I just froze I just couldn't make any words like the whole quadrant of my brain that has language in it just shut right down and I stood there staring up at him like I was a wide mouth bass just my mouth just <laughs> opening and closing just kind of gaping and I felt like a rotisserie chicken at the grocery store like my skin got all hot and crackly and I felt <laughs> dizzy and spinning around and my husband was right there that day. And he was like standing like 10 feet away, looking at me like, what is wrong with you? You know, <laughs> I don't know. it's hormones. I don't know. Wow. Oh but it was God. the weirdest experience. Cause I don't know if you can tell, but like talking is my favorite hobby. Like I, <laughs> on earth do I love to do more than talking. So to not be able to talk was very strange. Um, wow. There it is. It was, it was a combination of the handsomeness and the fame, like together. It was very, yeah. Very so um, I was nervous that the same thing might happen when I, I did also get to go to the happiness for beginners set. Mm -hmm. I got to pretend to be a wedding guest at the wedding of my own main character. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> but Ellie Kemper is in it. I got to meet her. She's absolutely lovely. Luke Grimes is in it. I got to meet him. He is very dashing. 
Um, and I also got to meet um, Blythe Danner, who um, yeah. played, uh, and I'm a huge fan of Blythe Danner from way back. So that was a sort of a peak life experience. I got to spend the day pretending to drink champagne at a wedding in the background with Blythe Danner. It was awesome. Wow. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. I love it. I love that. Did you help decide that Happiness for Beginners would be the next movie adaptation? Because you said that the director had come to you um, and said, oh, let's do another one. Were you in on that selection process? Okay. She picked it. She, picked it. she, um, she actually very sweetly said that after The Lost Husband did so well, she spent like a year kind of like um, reading other women's fiction authors and like okay. trying to find somebody to ask, you know, some book to work on. And she said she couldn't find anybody who she liked as much as me. So that was sweet. I feel like I should get that on a tattoo or something. That oh, was really nice. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So she came back and um, Happiness for Beginners, I think originally when she came to me for The Lost Husband, Happiness for Beginners was her second choice. So when we decided to work together again, I think that was kind of a no brainer for her. She really wanted to do that. It's kind of a story of like personal transformation for this woman who gets divorced and then goes to the wilderness to try and wake up her life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that story really resonated for Vicky. So she went, she wanted to do that one. I was like, great. I'm sure this isn't going to be the last movie adaptation scenario for you. So if you could pick yeah, if you um, do, you know anything? Do we have like breaking news? Okay. Well, well, the, the um, my book, Things You Save in a Fire, has been optioned. Um, okay. So, but but it's kind of you know that whole process is very slow, and you never really yeah. know how things are going to turn out. But I'm I'm rooting for it. That would be fun yeah. to. See. Okay, so if you could pick one, you would like to. Is that the the title that you'd like to see adapted, or would you like to see Hello Stranger? Oh, I, you know, I'd love to see them all. It's such a thrill. I'm such a huge movie person. Mm -hmm. You know, I just get really excited about all of that. I mean, it's so fun to see it come to life, you know, because it's one thing in your head. Yeah. And that's a good thing. And and what's great about movie adaptations is they're never really like the book. You know, they can't be because a, a book is 350 pages, you know, a fairly yeah. dense text. And a, a screenplay is 90 pages with yes. a lot of white space. So no matter what you do, um, a screenplay is going to be basically like a shrinky dink of the book. You know, it's going to be a little smaller version and uh, it's never going to be what it was in your head as a reader. But the great yeah. thing is no matter what kind of movie adaptations happen, um, the book is there. The book is always there. That place that you go into, you know, when you read that book that you helped create, you know, with the author because a book really is, a novel is a collaboration between the writer and the reader, right? Because like I say apple, but then the reader imagines the apple and, you know, yeah. I'm not going to get super specific about it. So it could be a Granny Smith. It could be a Fuji. Like there's lots of options. Right. And that's true for every single detail in the book. Like I say it, but the reader brings it to life. Right. And so a book, once you've read it and loved it, it's yours. It belongs to you in this really profound way. And the movie is never going to be what you pictured in your head, you know? But it'll be fun in a different way. It's a different fun thing. And it's so great that it's out there and it's going to capture other yeah. things. I've been so astonished by the Happiness for Beginners trailer, which just came out like last week. I don't know how they did it, but they captured the feeling of the book. It That trailer feels just like the book, you know, and it's not the same as the book, but it captures some kind of magic that's in the book. And I'm so excited to see it. It's just like a dream. In your author's note, you share about how receiving an historical romance novel as a 40th birthday gift changed your life. <laughs> so how did reading romance change your life? And do you recall that book's title? Oh my gosh. How many hours do we have? Like just lock the door. <laughs> We're not going home. This was a pivotal epiphany in my writing life because all of my early training as a writer was very literary. So, I, you know, I went to Vassar College, which is a very literary mm -hmm. place. And then I came home to Houston and I went to the University of Houston's creative writing program, which is also a very literary place. It's actually ranked second in the nation of creative writing programs. And I got a master's in fiction writing, which is a rather literary degree. And so all of my early training, you know, was about um, reading literary fiction, right? And studying that. 
And um, of course, at the same time that I was sort of doing that in one quadrant of my life, I also was loving Nora Ephron movies, right? Mm -hmm. And comedies of all kinds. And it took me a while to bring those two things together. So I read my first romance novel the year that I turned 40. And, um, you know, I didn't, I, I had the sort of, um, unquestioned, accidental, absorbed cultural snobbery around romance novels that I think a lot of people have. Mm. I hadn't, I didn't think of myself as snobby about them, but I just, I hadn't ever taken them seriously, you know, and, and I was sort of put off by the, by the covers, the chesty man candy on the covers was a little off putting. And so I, I hadn't really ever thought about it. And then this book came to me and I, and I didn't want to be rude to the giver. So I was like, well, I'll just take a look at it, you know? So I kind of opened it up and it was going to just skim the first chapter. And then the next thing I knew it was three hours later and I was in the car driving to the bookstore to get another one. Wow. And I felt like a person who had spent her entire life eating boneless, skinless chicken breast. And I had just discovered chocolate cake like that. It was that kind of a watershed moment for me where I was like, oh, I did not fully realize that reading could be this fun, right? I did not realize that reading could be this blissful and this addictive. Mm. Like for me, I think in my sort of early, more literary years, yeah. reading was always work. It was like an academic thing. It was a thing you yeah. did with the brain. And what was so great about like discovering romance was that I realized that reading could be a thing that you do with your whole heart and body and everything. And that it, that it can be fun and blissful and hopeful in these right. kind of radical ways. Um, and so it, it totally changed my writing life and my reading life. I mean, from that moment on, I did not read um, anything but romance for like at least a year, if not two or three years. I mean, it was a very long time. Yeah. And, um, and that's still my preferred thing. Like when I have a when I have a free Saturday and a fuzzy blanket and a hot cup of tea, like if I can pick any book to read, it's going to be like a super swoony, blissful romance. Oh, oh and you asked what was that first book? Yeah. It was um, Tessa Dare. And um, she is still one of my all-time favorite historical romance writers. She is so funny. Her banter is like, Mwah, chef's kiss, so good. Um, <laughs> have you met her? Have you met Tesla? I have met her, actually. And I followed her around like a little duckling. And I just <laughs> her old, up and down the block. I was very excited to meet her. I think it must have been a tiny bit alarming. But um, <laughs> she's so good at what she does. And one of the things I love that Tessa Dare does is she pulls you right in, like mm -hmm. page one. Mm -hmm. You know, she gets you invested in this person and she makes you care about this person and she makes it very clear right away what the stakes are. And, um, you know, for me, the hardest part of reading is always at that is at the beginning, because it's like you don't know who these people are. You don't know why you're even reading the book. You're not sure why it matters. Like it takes a while. You have to push yourself in for a little while before you kind of get your bearings. Right. And then you're like, OK, here we are. And then at that moment, the story starts to pull you. Instead of you having to push your way in, it grabs you and it tugs yes. you through. And um, for Tessa Dare's book, that's happening within like the first paragraph. So I fell madly in love with her and Julia Quinn and Lisa Claypas. And I read all of their historical, you know, books, all the Bridgertons and the um, the Wallflowers. And mm -hmm. I love them all, you know, and it was just it's been such a such a eye opening, heart opening journey. And it's really changed what I do in my own books. And um, I've thought a lot about romance and why it's important and why it's so tragic that we poo poo them in the way that we do culturally. Mm -hmm. We'd be living in a much happier world if we could get rid of some of that. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Now it's time for Quickies Q&A. What are you currently reading? So I am uh, weirdly <laughs> currently reading my own book because, <laughs> um, because I uh, did a buddy read on Instagram uh, for happiness for beginners. Right. And um, we were all reading along. And what I said was that at the end, I would annotate the copy that I was reading with, you know, sort of memories and trivia and yeah. fun things that I remembered about writing the story because the story was actually based on a real hiking trip that I took when I was in college. So there's lots of stuff that was inspired by real life. So I had lots to put in the margins. And then I was going to give away 
um, that book. Oh. Uh, so I, I, it's been a really, really crazy month. I've taken this book with me to New York city. I took it to Olathe, Kansas when I was doing a, a speaking thing there. And, um, it's traveled a lot. It's, it's had quite a, quite a life, this little book, but so I'm not quite done. Actually, it's been very funny because I'm sort of panicking that I need to hurry up and finish so that I can, <laughs> uh, send it off. But, um, yeah, so I'm almost done, but it's been very fun to go and reread that book because I have not read it in years, you know, it came out, this book came out in 2015. So it's been a little while and I'm rereading it and I'm like, this is really good. Like, <laughs> Well, I'd love to know, like, as you're reading your own work, are you, are you separated enough from it that you can enjoy it as a reader without being critical and saying, oh, gee, you know, I shouldn't have written that. I should have done that. You know, oh, you're able to turn off the critical yeah. part of your brain to enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, that's not always true. It depends, I think, uh, kind of where I am in the life cycle. But mm -hmm. I definitely have enough distance from this book that I'm just appreciating it. And and I will say that as a writer, um, I have trained myself when reading other people's books to look for what I'm loving about what those people are doing. Okay. So, um, I, you know, it's really easy when you want to be a writer to look at what other writers are doing wrong. That's a very mm. strong temptation, right? Like, uh, this dialogue is so wooden or whatever, you know, you, yeah. you complain about to yourself about how you would have done it better if this were your story. Um, but I have, I have sort of cured myself of the need to do that in my sort of grown up life, yeah. because I think you learn so much more when you're paying attention to what you love. Like that is how you get better as a writer. That's how you um, move toward whatever it is that you are going to be the best at. Because once you are aware of what you love, then you're paying attention to it in a new way. Yes. And it's through paying attention to these things that we get better at doing them, right? So, so I come at books looking, like on a treasure hunt, looking for the stuff that I can get excited about, the stuff that I can fall in love with, the stuff that I can learn things from the stuff that is going to delight me and like, what is hooking me? What is keeping me turning the pages? So I come at it that way for other people. And so I already am pretty good at doing that. And so I wound up doing that for myself. Like when I'm reading yeah. other people's books, I always mark up the books in the margins and I put check marks, like every bit of like great dialogue or like some like little zinger of a line or some beautiful, you know, piece of poetry going on in the prose. I'm like, check, 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 love it. I'll circle it. I'll underline it. Everything I love. And I just did the same thing to my own book. I just went through and I was like, this is hilarious. Check, 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 you know? <laughs> so it was nice to kind of take one of my own books and give it that same treatment. It was actually really surprising. Yeah. Well, I was not expecting that answer when I said currently reading. I've never had an author say, oh, I'm currently reading my book and annotating it. It's uh, rare for me to do that, but it's been a joy. Awesome. What's the last book that you read? Oh, okay. So I just, uh, I just discovered Abby Jimenez. So that mm -hmm. was like a really, uh, a, a glorious discovery for me because I, I reviewed her book, yours truly for book of the month club. Okay. Yeah. And, um, I spent this beautiful day, uh, out of my backyard, like lying in the grass on a blanket, just, just tearing through this book. And, you know, when you're a writer, there's, I always have a little bit of trepidation when I start other people's books. If I'm not, if I don't know their writing already, because it's kind of like, Ugh, is this person like, how's it going to go? Like, are they going to be good? <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, with, with that book, like within the first page, I was like, oh, I can relax. Like we're good to go. This lady knows what she is doing. I just read Christina Lauren's um, uh, true love experiment. and oh. love that I'm a massive Christina Lauren fan. I, I love them both. So that's been really fun. So awesome. those have been my most recent reads. Oh, oh, and I just actually read a thriller. Oh, did you? It's very rare for me because I really gravitate more towards, you know, rom-coms. Yeah. It's called The Soulmate by Sally Hepworth, who um, has my same publisher. And it's kind of a domestic thriller. And it was absolutely page turning and gripping and re like really very moving and kind of meaningful. Um, but she had so many twists in that book. I almost didn't know what to do with myself. Like it was just like every page I was like, Oh, what is happening? You know, it was, it was fun. That was fun. Ooh, there was I, never a dull moment for sure. I am intrigued. Yeah. She's great. Which book is on your to be read pile? Maybe I should say books are on your to be read pile. <laughs> oh, what's on my list? I've got a bunch. I've got a big long list. Um, and I keep it, I like type it up so I don't forget. Cause I'm very forgetful. Um, so Talia Hibbert is on my list to read. Um, 
also uh I've got some Joanna Bourne historical romance books that are on my list to read. Um, she writes about um, spies, like mm-hmm. historical romance is about spies, which I love. Um, there's a book called Born to Be Good by, it's a nonfiction book by a social scientist named Dacker Keltner that I keep wanting to read. And it's all about, you know, I think it's going to be about how human beings are nicer than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's hope so. Let's I hope, hope that's what it's going to be. I, and I, you know, I love reading books that are kind of encouraging about the human race. So that's always a a draw for me. Um, Trying to think what else. I've got a bunch that are there and that might be everything that I can remember off the top of my head, but I've got a list of like 12 that are just waiting for me. Okay. Oh, oh, the Finley Donovan books are on my list. I'm always just scrambling. And when I'm writing my own stuff, I tend to not read other people. I just reread what I'm working on over and over and over like yeah. a crazy person. And so um, that cuts down on the amount of like available months that I have in the yeah. year to really read new stuff. Um, but it's summer. So this is my time. Summer and fall is my time to be reading other nice. folks and just devouring books that are new to me. So I'm excited. Which book have you reread more than once? Um, all the Jane Austens um. multiple times. Um, you know, she's just a like a long term love for mm-hmm. me um uh one book I remember rereading was uh the Rosie Project oh uh by uh Graham Graham Simpson yeah yep and uh that came out a few years ago and I read it and I I wasn't sure what I was what it was going to be like I, I wasn't really I didn't have expectations for it yeah. and then um it made me cry but like in a really good way yeah you know like he got me. He really got me with that book. So I went back a few years later and thought, I wonder what it would be like to reread it. And I cried again. But I I like it when a book makes me yeah. cry. I wanna cry, you know, but I don't, but I don't want to cry at the end. I want to cry just before the end. I want to have my heart broken, then I want to have it be put back together before yes. we're done. Of I don't course. want to end a book feeling despondent. That's very important for me. What is your favorite reading snack? Ooh. Um probably just like I don't know that I snack too much while reading but if I were going to snack on something it would probably be just pecans because we always have them around they grow in Texas and we um, know that (laughs) yeah in our old house we had a pecan tree in the backyard and the whole backyard would just be covered by pecans all the time no kidding Um, so um and um my family you know I'm from Texas and our family has a a ranch like a working cattle ranch that my mom runs that was her parents place and Um, we've got pecan trees all over the ranch and we gather them up whenever there's a good year for pecans and then they're just everywhere. That's a real thing with us. (laughs) Wow. So pecans, like, I don't imagine them for some reason growing on trees. I don't know why. (laughs) They do. They do. (laughs) That just shows what a city gal I am (laughs) because I, it never occurred to me that they, and they come in a nut that you have to take them out. Like you have to shell. Yeah. 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 They're, it's like a hard wooden shell and you get these crackers and you crack okay. them in. and it's a whole art to sort of pull the yeah. like, half out without breaking it. It's, oh, yeah. wow. Do you throw some salt on them? Like, do you salt them up or you just eat them? You like, can, wow. you can actually, um, you can cook them um, with butter and salt, which is delicious. Um, you, you know, you can put them in like a cast iron skillet and some melted butter and just kind of stir oh. them around, but no, we just eat them raw. They're delicious. I do enjoy pecans, but again, I just never thought of, I never thought of them being on a tree. <laughs> my mind is, blo- you're blowing my mind. <laughs> well, you should come to the ranch sometime and we'll show you. They're big, beautiful trees. Okay, I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to shift into writing. What yeah. is your romance writing superpower? Banter. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, hands down, hands down. Um, you know, I've spent my entire life from the age of 12 studying stories and trying to figure out how they work and what makes them, you know, what brings them to life and what makes them page turners or not. And, um, you know, I've done a ton of schooling about it. I've obsessed over it, you know, decades and decades of thinking about all this stuff. But um, the one thing that I have never had to study or wrestle with or think about or try to do is dialogue. 
because if I get the characters into the right situation, Mm -hmm. they just start talking to each other. And I'm just basically sitting there taking dictation. I'm just listening to them talk and they're saying funny stuff and they're being delightful. And I'm just writing it down as fast as I possibly can and trying to capture it. So yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's, I don't know. I don't know why that happens, but I'm so grateful that it does because it's one of the most fun things in my life that I have imaginary people in my head talking to each other all the time and saying funny stuff. Yeah. Um, but I love to write dialogue. It is never hard. I never even have to try. I just listen to them talking and write it down. So yeah, that's yeah. definitely my superpower. Are you a pantser, a plotter, or a planter? <laughs> is the planter the hybrid between the two? Yes. Okay. That's me. That's me. That's me. (laughs) I would love to be a plotter. I think people who are plotters have beautiful, easy lives. That's my, that's my dream is to be a plotter, (laughs) but I, um, I cannot ever do it. I try. So like my best version of a plot is kind of like a, like a list of like 10 things that I would like to see happen in the story, 10 to 20 things. Just, it's just a list. It's not like a it's not like an outline with like Roman numerals. It's just a list. Just a list, got it. Um, but what I find is that I really can't know what's going to happen into the store in the story until I'm seeing what's happening in the story. So as much as I might want to plot it out in advance, so much of what happens in the story grows out of what just happened, right? right. In this very organic way. And so I it, I can't really know until it's until I'm in it. But that said, I don't want to, I don't want to just go in blind and, and not have any kind of structure to guide me. Right. I really do feel very strongly that every single thing that happens in a story needs to be there for a reason. And it needs to be driving us towards something and uh, it needs to be serving a, a function, right? That's how you keep it tight and and, and muscular and, you know, and, and keep the pacing going the way you need it to. And that's how you keep people from getting bored and uh, wandering off, right. To go watch Ted Lasso or something like my, my greatest fear in life is boring people, you know? And so it's such, it's so crucial to be always thinking about how do you construct it? How do you shape it? How do you move through the story in a way that will keep people from being able to just like put it down and go off and do something else? Right. So I think about it a lot. I think about structure a lot. And I try very hard as I'm writing to shape it properly and to know where I'm going. But that said, I also find that I can't just think it all up in advance. You know, there's a story about JK Rowling, like coming up with all of Harry Potter and like a coffee shop and mm-hmm. writing it all out on napkins or something. And I, that's like mm-hmm. my worst nightmare is the idea that there's someone out there who can do that. Because for me, <laughs> it's very like, I, it's like, I one time heard somebody describing writing as like um, driving in the dark with your headlights on. Right. And you can only kind of see. Right a little bit of what's in front of you as you get closer. And that's definitely very much kind of my experience. I'm a hybrid for sure. Okay. Which is more difficult for you to write the opening line of a novel or the very last line? I don't usually start until I am hearing the opening line in my head. Okay. So, um, I, so yeah, I don't, so usually the opening line just kind of shows up for me at some point and then I know it's time to start writing I've done enough research I've been sitting with it long enough and it's time to get moving Uh, so that one usually comes sort of like magic Um, and then the last line I take very seriously I mean I take the beginning and the ending are so important obviously also so is everything in the middle but um but I you know the last line the last paragraph the the ending of the story is the thing that people are going to kind of carry forward with them. Mm -hmm. And so I do want it to be phenomenal. Um, Yeah. And so I do more. You have a great last line. You have a great last line in Hello Stranger. In in Hello Stranger. Yeah. I I love that last line. And it's something that I very much believe it's kind of a guiding life philosophy. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to say what it is? You, you yeah. is, it's up to you if you, if yeah, you feel, I yeah, I don't go think ahead. that's a spoiler. Uh, yeah. Um, the last line of Hello Stranger is the more good things you look for, the more you find. And I think about it all the time because I really believe, um, that you know, the process of looking for good things in life changes your experience of the life that you're living. 
And this is also a, a kind of a motif in my book, Happiness for Beginners, the one that's about to be a movie. You know, it's it, yeah. that book also talks a lot about how important it is just to look for the good things and to be grateful. Um, it's something that I'm not very good at naturally. I tend to sort of fixate on everything that's wrong. <laughs> of course, um, yeah, yeah. But I'm trying to learn how to be better at just coming from a place of gratitude and abundance and, you know, yeah. and counting all my blessings. I really, really, really want to be a person who's good at doing that. So I just keep, keep, keep trying. Which is easier for you to write, the book dedication or the acknowledgments? Oh, the book dedication. The acknowledgments are really hard for me because <laughs> I always panic that I'm leaving someone out. And I <laughs> invariably do. I always leave somebody important out, like not some throwaway person, but like some critical yeah. person. And then I'm embarrassed. Um, I never, ever want to leave anybody out. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Acknowledgements are big. I need to, I need to start minimizing them and just saying thanks to everybody because then I'll right. know that um, I didn't miss anyone. It's a lot of pressure. Have, have you ever had someone say, hey, I wasn't in your acknowledgements. Like, is no. it okay? No, 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 no one, no one's ever been <laughs> mad at me about it, but I've been mad at myself just, uh... <laughs> about it. You know, like, uh, like I realized while I was reading the acknowledgements for Hello Stranger out loud for the audio book, oh, I, okay. I realized that I had forgotten to thank Macmillan Audio. Like the whole team <laughs> of incredibly nice people who are so great to me and who have supported my book so much. Like, I was writing the acknowledgments last fall. Audio mm -hmm. stuff doesn't usually start till the spring. And suddenly I'm reading this out loud and I'm like, oh my God, I forgot Macmillan. <laughs> so wait, you did the narration for the audio book? So it's a actually a wonderful actress named Patty Murin reads the, um, the actual story. Okay. Um, oh. But at the end, I read the author's note. Oh. And the acknowledgments. So they so they bring me in right at the very end, which I love because I love to read. But I also am madly in love with Patty Murin, who's a genius, and she starred in Frozen on Broadway. Um, oh, wow. so she's really yeah, she's totally phenomenal. Um, so she's great. So I'm very grateful to have her. But um, yeah, I was excited to read the author's note. I had a lot of fun. Oh, that's cool. Now you didn't mention this earlier. What are you currently working on? Can well, I just, so I have not yet started my new book because I just turned one in um, about three weeks ago mm -hmm. and it's my summer 2024 book mm -hmm. and it's totally delicious. I'm so excited about this <laughs> book right now. I'm madly in love and it is actually a connected story to my last summer book, The Bodyguard. Oh, okay. So um, it's, uh, so in The Bodyguard, Jack Stapleton is this sort of famous actor mm -hmm. who's kind of the love interest in the story and he's very famous because he starred in a in a wildly popular movie called the destroyers which is just something i made up mm -hmm. and uh the new book is about the guy who was the screenwriter of that movie oh okay and um so jack stapleton actually makes a little cameo appearance um oh. in this new book and uh it's fun to see him again um, Meryl Streep also has a cameo in this. In this new Wait, book. what? <laughs> in the Bodyguard, there was a joke, or a little uh, bit of a joke, about yeah. how Jack Stapleton's sort of like life dream was to have a reason to kiss Meryl Streep in a movie, and um, and then in this new book, um, we run into Jack Stapleton and Meryl Streep having brunch together, and it's because they're going to be in a in a romantic movie together. Now, do you think in putting Meryl Streep in your novel, there's a better chance of maybe there being an adaptation in which she agrees to appear as herself? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, I would be very surprised if that were to happen. But I also do genuinely, like truly, in a very heartfelt way, love Meryl Streep. And so it's okay. just fun to put her in the book. She uh, she went to Vassar College and I also went to Vassar College. And oh. I went to Vassar for two reasons. One, there was no math requirement. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, no, you could, you didn't have to take math. So I was like, sold, I'm in. But then the other big reason was because Meryl Streep went there and she gave a phenomenally amazing graduation speech that they played at the recruiting <laughs> at oh, the wow. recruiting meeting for Vassar. <laughs> I was like, I walked out and I was like, I'm in. Whatever that is, I want to do that. I want to do that. Wow. So th it's not out of the realm of possibility for Meryl Streep to be in some way involved in the promotion 
of your 2024 novel. I mean, it seems very unlikely, but of course I would never say no if she if she wanted to read it. Oh. I'm sure she's very busy. She seems like a lady who's got a lot going on. It would be great if she could do the or- audio narration. Oh for- I would die of joy. That would be awesome. Well, I think at least your publicity team should send her an advance reader copy. I mean, <laughs> right? Why not? Why not? Sure. Why not? You're an absolute delight, Catherine. I'm so pleased that you were able to take time to join me here on Reader Seeks Romance. You really made my my day. Oh my gosh. I loved every second of being here. It was so fun to talk to you. You made me laugh so much. Thank you. Thank you.